We're recording now. This is the um, second episode of number the two. what? Number two. Number number two of uh, new directions in healing therapy. New paradigms in healing therapies. Yeah, I figure by the third one we'll remember the name. <laughs> okay. So today we have the beautiful Megwin White. And hello. <laughs> hello. And Bill Paravano, the knee pain guru. And Megwin, what are we gonna talk about today? Well, <clears throat> first we're gonna talk about why I can't speak today. Okay. Um <laughs> We can start there, just so the viewers aren't too disturbed yeah. at home. Yeah. Um, I'm releasing some stuff from the body, having a little bit of a healing healing experience right now, either low level, some kind of cold, or some kind of healing release. And uh, so I have not felt, I have, my energy's felt great, but I've just had this kind of release happening. So I'm going to do my best with miming and expressing myself through other means rather than my voice. So it's going to be a very interesting exploration and journey. Yeah. Right. And Bill's, and Bill's going to talk more than he normally does. Bill's going to talk more than he normally does. Yes. <laughs> and I'm also going to walk you through some stuff you can actually do. So if you are watching this and you've lost your voice or you have like a scratchy throat or sinus stuff, this would be really good stuff that you can actually uh, use to help uh, your body clean itself out, uh, heal from it faster. Can we start with that? that sounds great. Yeah. Okay. Let's go. Okay. <laughs> so from a... <laughs> From a lymphatic perspective, what's going on is there's tension patterns that get held in the body as a result of um, the, the weather changing. So let's say it gets cold, cold front moves in, so Megwin starts holding her shoulders differently because of it's colder now. And, and these are all hypotheticals. It, it is a lot colder now. Sure. So what happens is the tension patterns, what, what do we do when we get cold? It, we kind of bring the shoulders forward and up, so it creates this tension that's going on in this area of our body. Well, the lymphatic points that directly correspond with the throat, the sinuses, um, the voice, the ears, when, when we normally get colds around this time of the year, is all in this area. Primarily around the collarbone. That's where I feel it the most. So, You'll feel it above, on top of, and below the collarbone. You'll feel like sensitive points. Just amazing. Well, thanks, Megwin. However, um, you'll also feel it at the tips of your ribs, mm. where, where your ribs right are along the sternum. A little less. Bit. So, the, um, the, how to address this, one would be to increase water intake. Because the lymphatic system kind of gets gooped up because of um, we get dehydrated. We don't want to drink as much when it gets colder. And what we are drinking isn't necessarily hydrating the body. It tends to dehydrate the body. So uh, coffee, other things like that <laughs> actually dehydrate the body. So making sure you're drinking lots of water is going to help flush that out as well as um, just rubbing the pain tolerance. Mm. Not real intense, but like six to seven seconds, move up your collarbone, go down on top of your collarbone, and then below your collarbone. And you'll find these sore points and just kind of rub them a little bit. And the really cool part about it is when you find those sore points, they'll be kind of like, uh, ow, <laughs> they feel a little sensitive. And when you rub them, what happens is it contracts the lymph node corresponding mm. with that area, the throat, the sinuses, uh, the voice, uh, in the, in the ears as well. And that will start to 
contract those lymph nodes and start to drain them. It'll move okay. those out. So if you're diligent about working these points and drinking water, uh, lemon water is actually really good. And what will mm. happen is you'll actually start to be able to clear your throat and you'll get more um, ability to speak. Or the sore throat will begin to dissipate and go away. So this is very much on a, um, you know, a, a physical level that we're dealing with stuff. That there is a physical, you have uh, germs or viruses or something that's kind of gathered in this area causing the body to, to start losing the voice or the inner ear infection or sinus infection or stuff like that. And getting that to, to clean itself out is the first step. Now, of course, beyond that, you want to make sure you're taking plenty of uh, eating good food, making sure your supplements are real good, like tons of vitamin C at this this juncture is really good because the vitamin C will knock out viruses and bacteria. And I shoot for vitamin C to pain, or not pain tolerance, to uh, digestive tolerance. So the moment vitamin C is water soluble, so the moment you get too much vitamin C, you'll be running to the bathroom, like your bowels will clean themselves out, which is what your body wants because you want to get all that stuff out of you. Make sure your body gets uh, flushed out, cleaned out, and um, that's how colds and flus like perpetuate themselves is because they're sitting in this warm, mm -hmm. damp environment that they're not getting flushed out. We aren't moving a whole lot. We're laying in bed. So all that stuff just kind of manifests and keeps us sick longer than we need to be. Now, I know for you, we were only talking about uh, the voice. It's not like a real sickness sickness, but the, the mechanics of all of it are the same. Absolutely. Yeah. So as you work those points and you drink your water while we're talking today... I think it would be really good to kind of talk about your process uh, from an emotional standpoint and an energetic standpoint of what you're clearing out. Yeah. Th so that like this physical piece supports the emotional and the energetic component that gets stuck okay. in the physical body. Right. Because I've had a couple of other experiences where a similar kind of release has happened to me. Um, a few other times in my life, and um, it was all connected to the lymphatic system. Um, maybe actually I can remember four big times where each time I actually lost my voice and had like a very intense emotional, sort of old emotional trauma kind of getting released in the body. Um, and so I'm familiar with it. Um, I had, you're getting a little blurry. <laughs> okay. Okay. You're okay now. Okay. Um, so I f felt I, as though it actually was triggered because of a process that I had started this week. I started a meditation, a group meditation for women, um, around healing and around connecting the voice and sexual center and, and just aligning as women. And we had talked about this a little bit outside, but um, sort of beyond that group healing, I feel that I'm in a space right now in my life where I'm also healing a lot around my own mother as well. Mm -hmm. And so ever since I started that meditation, first of all, I felt a lot of energy kind of uh, coming through the call. Like I could, I was feeling a lot of emotions and, and, and a lot of it wasn't necessarily just on a conscious level, it just was feeling this kind of flood of emotion. Um, and then after the call, that's when I started to feel this kind of goopy stuff sort of coming up. And um, every night, pretty much this week, I've been doing meditation and more of an emotional clearing meditation and releasing uh, a lot of just sorrow, you know, kind of old, old, very deep, um, sorrow and just for the viewers that are watching so they don't maybe understand um, that I as a child I had an experience of sexual trauma but um, 
my mother, I believe, now kind of looking back on it, I can see she may have had some kind of schism because she stayed with that man and ended up abandoning me and her, her other children. So, um, you know, beyond that core that wound, the sexual trauma, I've always had this kind of core wound around this mother energy. And um, so I really made a point, especially after the meditation, to just start going a little deeper into that and trying to sort of look at that experience sort of beyond the veil, you know, because so if you tell someone something like that, they'll say, oh, that was horrible. How could your mother do something like that? And, um, but everything has two sides, you know. So, um, so as I've been going through this process of just kind of clearing this very old sorrow, you know, it's coming out in my body. And in some ways, I have to say that I appreciate that it comes out in my body because it makes me feel... I guess, like, wow, I can see that something actually is really happening. It's not just, you know, on some kind of etheric plane. I imagine that there's some kind of healing happening. Um, so I feel, in some, in a strange way, I feel good because I'm actually experiencing what that, um, what that pain is on a physical, you know, as a physical manifestation, and also receive support from a friend. That's kind of, that's like a sister. She sort of started this healing process. And then I was telling you that last night she did a lot of very deep body work with me and working with hot stones and, um, you know, which kind of ties back into our theme of these new paradigms in which I am creating within my community here in New York. We help each other, you know, we support each other through these different healing crises. You don't, you don't have to be doing it for a living. You know, you don't have to be calling yourself a healer. But we show up for each other and we're using that intuitive guidance. You know, she started to intuitively tap in. And she said, I think you're, you have to go deeper into this, this wound with your mother. And that felt resonated with me very, you know, very deeply. Um, and she's not necessarily working as a healer. But she's obviously someone that, you know, is helping me through that process. So that's, I think that's actually even um, a wonderful topic maybe for us to even explore today mm -hmm. is this idea of creating healing communities, mm -hmm. communities that are there to help support each other through these different processes. So it's not just a getting to know you kind of thing, like, creating different kinds of experiences um, so that we can we can help support each other through these different um, these different processes that we're all in yeah so. and Meg when I, I like that idea about creating the healing communities and I see a couple different directions we can go one is the recognition of when we start feeling bad or we start getting sick and what does that mean on a on a bigger level you use the term when you look through the veil you know you had the sorrow that was coming up and if you just stayed at that level on like a human plane then you stay in like this victim mode but if you choose mm. to come like through the veil was a term that you used and look down on what's happening here. There's an empowering element to it that realizing that we're more than just this physical body. Um, yeah. So there's, there's that, that component. Um, there's a component on when um, colds and flus, we have epidemics in certain parts of the year <laughs> and how that's a, a healing more on a global level. Mm. You know, the transition that societies are making, like a lot of the stuff that's going on, the trauma that's being expressed in the United mm. States, especially after this election and all the protests and all the violence and uh, attacks on the police and uh, attacks on minority groups. And, you, you know, so there's a lot of like this craziness oh, well. that's going on. Okay. And then... Uh, Then I think what you were talking about as far as creating the healing communities, creating that support from those around you, um, 
I, I think those are three different directions that we can go three different directions today. <laughs> and, and I'm, I'm cool going with any, any of those. Um, so, uh, but what I think the first and foremost is I would like to help you as much as possible on this call to see how, you know, check in periodically, no matter what we're talking about to see how that's clearing up, because I think it's, a uh, evidence to those that are watching of how quickly the body can heal if given the right conditions to do so. So, yeah. so there's that, there's that place of, you know, what's going on with your voice? How's that feel? Um, are you feeling different? You know, just kind of checking in periodically and see how that goes with the water and, and the massaging those points. Cause you can do those points every, you know, five, 10 minutes, you can work Ooh. with those that continues to, it's like a pump. You're getting that pump moving in the body, um, uh, the lymphatic system being the pump. Uh, so those, yeah. those are my thoughts. I appreciate that. Because <laughs> this is really our call. Like if no yeah. one saw this, we'd be co completely content and just sitting here and, and just chatting because right. it – the space that you need to keep kind of going into yeah sort of bending disbelief and um going more into that space of not knowing and discovering mm -hmm. what wants to you know be expressed between us yeah yeah i, I want to well, point out to everyone on the call that you had your hair done since the last oh call. well yeah i did it myself actually nice very yeah. nice um, we could flirt a little bit too. <laughs> <laughs> sure, Megan. <laughs> well, I feel drawn to talking about healing communities. Cool. I'm um, good with that. Because we just had an art party last night. Mm -hmm. And th this is something that um, I think has been very, has been very powerful for me in my life is to create community, especially around, around art specifically, because I do believe that art is kind of an integrative healing force, not kind of, it, it really is. Sure. Um, but um, I think that so much of the trauma that we're seeing out there in the world, I think that so much of it is actually increased by the disease of the disconnect more than anything else. Mm-hmm. And just this feeling of isolation that so many people have and sort of going with the flow of whatever the culture, you know, cultural programming is. And it becomes more challenging actually to find, to discover new things around healing, to, to make discoveries. Mm -hmm. um, so within the healing community that I have here in New York, you know, we've grown quite a bit and it was amazing just last night to be in the presence and the space of all these people and just how much the nervous system relaxes and, you know, opens up and that, how that creative flow also stimulates um, a kind of, you know, a natural relationship to uh, like almost like a family, you mm -hmm. know, like that we all need that family, familial energy. And maybe perhaps because I'm so far away from my family, they're all in California, that you know, this healing community here is very much like family. Mm -hmm. And uh, just kind of throwing in that slightly different um, exploration of creating art together, mm -hmm. I have to say, makes such a difference mm -hmm. in terms of how we relate with each other. And that doesn't have to be art, you know, be something else but something that kind of helps to push people outside of this sort of comfort zone of just relating in conversation I think is extremely healing um, and uh, and one other thing I would wanted to say about just my own body right now is that after getting this body work from my friend yesterday I realized how much I need to get you know be getting body work also mm -hmm. Um, but you know, having a community that you can also feel comfortable touching and connecting and relating on that physical level 
is so healing, is so healthy, you know, for the overall body. I'm just curious, do you have healing, do you have a healing community where you are? Do you? There, yes. In, in the, in the Asheville area, there is a mm -hmm. tremendous amount of healers. Um, I haven't connected at nearly as much, um, with the healers in the Asheville area for whatever reason have kind of been focused on personal things and uh, but I, I have felt a sense of wanting to create it or wanting to connect with other people and I've, I have a friend of mine actually his name is Stephen Opper um, and I do want to connect you to if I haven't done that already on Facebook but Stephen is really into movement like all sorts of movement stuff and he'd be a great one to have on the call like this well, uh, but but I meet with him and it, it it's more from like a martial arts perspective but we have a real with such an emphasis on movement any places that are restricted in the movement is where that gets um, struck or worked with from a martial arts perspective which actually releases tension and heals the body um, cause in those places where there's tension, we hold our breath. When we hold our breath, that's a restriction of, um, energy, blood, oxygen, whatever is going on when we're holding our breath in that place of fear. Um, yeah, so I, we do have healing communities, but I haven't connected it probably to the capacity that you have in New York City. Um, I think here. Yeah. And you know that there there's this place I I'm a I think I'm a little particular about who I trust in that space because sometimes you can get people that don't have clear intentions. They I mean they want to help you, but they're just not at a good place where they start working with you and they actually make things worse sometimes. Sometimes. So I some I, there many um healing modalities they're only from a um, the the perspective of the of all the different healing modalities many of them are only in like this small space be it only well, ener energetic yeah i mean most of the people that i'm talking about i guess in terms of the healing community <laughs> A lot of them are not like necessarily healers in the world, you know. Okay. Um, I would say that like we're coming together because of like some a common ethos, mm -hmm. a common, you know, desire to be expressed more authentically, mm -hmm. and to also expand um, our understanding of many different things: science, technology. Uh, personal sort of interpersonal relating mm -hmm. and also art mm -hmm. so I, not everybody's here is a body worker or anything like that I wanted to sort of oh, make that oh yeah got that here. Um, it, like we're coming together because we want to like really talk about the deeper stuff you know, to connect on things that are mutually inspiring for us. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, we seem to attract a similar type of person, you know, mm -hmm. kind of, it's like a, like, it's kind of like a hive and it's grown only for probably over the last three years. Mm -hmm. And it really started to grow when we started to decide to, you know, create art together. We've created some performance art pieces together and, Mm. We've created a lot of different types of events and sort of themes around the events. Um, but everyone seems to be sort of at the cutting edge of sort of technology and science and art mm. and like in this more innovative space. Mm -hmm. So, but we also relate to each other kind of like kids. That's sort of like the common thread. Yeah. Very innocent, you know, way of connecting. And um, I've definitely gotten much more conscious about being very selective. I'm so sensitive now. I mean, I think, I don't know if it's getting older and just definitely more discerning, but I have a really hard time just being around, you know, uh, 
I have to be more conscious about who I'm relating with yeah. and, and can be around. Even just I'm sensitive to the sounds, to so many different things. Um, so I like that, actually. Mm -hmm. But it does make it challenging, especially when you're going out you know, and trying to experience the nightlife in New York. And it's made it hard. <laughs> yeah, okay. I could see that. So, so to answer your question directly, no, I don't have a group like that that I connect with. Well, you could be a part of our group. Okay, perfect. I'll come we'll to New Skype, York. We'll Skype you in. Okay, cool. That'd be fun. Nice. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I I don't know. I, it's um, I just haven't connected with with people in the Asheville area like that. Um, not not to that level that you're talking about. I do have people that I know here and there, but nothing to that capacity. And, um, yeah. And, and I don't know if, if that's so much, a, a reflection of Asheville or a reflection of me. Like I'm just been kind of in this place of being more, uh, isolated and secluded time with my daughter. That's been really healing on a lot of levels. Um, Cause she's been such a mirror for me, you know, like it's like immediately if there's something not in, in alignment with me, she's like expressing it. Wow. Yeah. Wow. It, it's oh, pretty that's cool. Like serious feedback loop. It, there's, I don't even know if you call it a feedback loop. It's like playing ping or playing tennis with your face right against the wall. It's like, boom, it's like wow. r right back. So she's a, a really great, um, mirror, mirror for me, um, teaches, teaches me a lot, which is extremely, uh, insightful and humbling all at the same time. Um, yeah, so my mind is going a couple different directions of like, almost like I want a topic switch and I don't know if it's because I'm avoiding the topic or... It's time to switch. Uh, yeah. Well, I just want to share one last thing about our gathering. That you know. Um, show the sherbet. Show the sherbet. Show the sherbet. So, well, the thing I like to do with our gatherings is to use. We just create a really simple art project, like something. It's like it does not take skill to do this project. You know what I mean? Like you don't have to be some great artist, but that whatever we're creating is a part of some kind of ritual, um, art experience. So like, for instance, even when you put ornaments on the Christmas tree, if you celebrate Christmas, this is a kind of ritual art, you know, that you're coming together, you're, you're, you're decorating, you're creating a, a way for people to, to connect on a deeper level. And, um, and also and it's tied to beauty. So yesterday we did uh, painting rocks uh, in the theme of art is the shield of consciousness. So just with this idea, this intention of creating, creating a, a, a talisman, call that like in more spiritual terms, you know, a power object that you can put on your altar or you can set aside somewhere to remind you of whatever that intention was and also whatever those experiences were. Um, and I think that just having that simple idea of creating something that's tied to some kind of ritual art, it can be anything, it can be face painting, it can be, you know, um, uh, food art, it can be, you know, whatever it is, but if it's tied some t somehow to some kind of ritual that brings people together, it's a very powerful way to start creating community. And I think that's the piece that people don't realize. And they wonder why are we not creating more deep community? And I would say that's like the, that's like the secret sauce mm. is that idea of creating some kind of ritual, artistic um, offering that was, speaking of which, my friend that just passed by, if you heard that noise, <laughs> it sounds strange. Um, it's like there's a you said you didn't have the community ha happening where you were, 
And I just know that wherever I've been, I sort of have that kind of naturally gravitate towards, you know, wanting to create things with people. And that's when I notice the shift when we do something that brings people into their five-year-old. Mm. You know, if you if you can bring grown adults, these are very intelligent people that are coming together, and everyone that comes, by the way, there's usually a couple people that are kind of like, this is weird. You know, like I have this couple guys yesterday, they're totally grown men. They've never done anything like this as an adult, yeah. like painting rocks. And they were sitting there maybe for like 30 or 40 minutes, did not paint anything. Mm -hmm. Then there was a little paint on the rock, you know, painted it brown, left it there, yeah. nothing happening. Then I got that yellow, all of a sudden, the yellow goes on all of a sudden that's something all of a sudden he's deep in it yeah. and creating this whole like you know three box um so what i'm saying is that sometimes it takes a little time to kind of seduce that that innocent part because we've been taught to hide it and to to kind of keep it yeah. sequestered yeah but there's I a lot of there's so much power in awakening that those parts of ourselves. There is. And I can speak from a guy's perspective. Like after I blew out my knee and I was so rigid and regimented, it was training, it was lifting weights, it was biking, it was running, it was doing judo, uh, it was work. And there was such a regimen with that that when I blew out my knee, now all of a sudden it's like, Oh, I can't do the majority of that anymore. What, where do I do with all this energy? Where do I put it? And I remember ending up in situations very much like those guys that were painting the rock brown. And honestly, you know what goes through a guy? Guy's mind when he's in that place, it's like, Art, what the fuck am I supposed to do? This is stupid. Like, seriously, that, that's what, what happens. And the, there's this, there, it's been a process over the past 18, 19 years of just, that's like ego talking and of just going through so many difficult experiences in my life where it just breaks down, the, the body breaks down, the mind breaks down, the emotions break down, and it gets to this place where it's like you, you get permission to act like a kid again. And that's why most people in their life have most freedom when they're a kid or when they're like 80s, 90s years old, 80, 90 years old, when they don't care anymore. <laughs> you know, it's like for some reason they have that permission on the bookends of their life, but in the middle, there's this tension or there's this uh, something that's holding on that's saying, oh, I have to show up this way, I have to be this way, I have to act this way, I have to talk this way, I have to think this way, even though it doesn't work. Even though it's not working, like their life is frigging miserable. You know, you could, you could see it on their face, you could see it in the way their body moves, you could see it in how they respond in questions it's so like their their expression is muffled and i i believe the sicknesses the colds the flus the disease uh the traumas all of that is about break to break that shell mm. so people can get to a more genuine and authentic expression of who they are mm. and if they're looking at it from that human perspective, if they're just looking at it on our side of the veil, then what ends up happening is then they're victims. Then it's like there's nothing they could do about it. There's no options. There's no choices. Fuck it. Why bother? If they're playing small. However, like you had so eloquently put before, you look on the other side of it and you look from like this 30,000 foot view on the dynamics of the patterns that are going on and you're like, oh, this is a complete different 
change a direction in my life. I should embrace this instead of holding on to what I'm the perception of what I'm losing, like start running in the direction that your life is moving and you'll get to that cool place faster. And in order to get to those, those cool, that cool place faster, I do think that there's a process of, you know, in order to get beyond the veil, we also do have to get these emotions, these energies do have to get released. Absolutely. Be witnessed and seen because, you know, there's a lot of movements out there where it's just think positive. You know, it's like you manifest whatever you, you put your mind on, which is absolutely true. You know, it's absolutely true. And um, there's also a natural healing process. There's a shedding. There's a there's a, there's an emotional um, process that we are going through just being human and alive. And it's and it's beautiful. Yes. And it's very there's a lot of knowledge and wisdom, you know, wrapped up in those emotional experiences. If we are yeah. to allow ourselves to go a little bit into that meta level space of mm. being a witness, this is how I experience as an actor too. Mm. It's a little easier for me maybe sometimes going through that because I was an actor. Because uh -huh. as an actor, you're given permission to go into these very deep emotional expressions and you are just such a witness. It's like being a meditator, you know, going through um, these very, very high level energy emotional experiences and you are able to keep your lens open and clear mm -hmm. um and what happens i think you know when you don't have that experience of being able to observe yourself going through whatever the emotional you know process is is that we uh, have sort of naturally trained and programmed uh, the culture to be ashamed of those emotional experiences because somehow that means that you're weak. You're going through something. You're not a winner. Mm -hmm. If you're crying, you're clearly not a winner. Right. Right. Um, if you're angry, clearly something is not hap not good in your life. You know, mm -hmm. there's these kind of judgments that we place on these emotional energies. And I have to say that was probably the biggest gift I had in my life was to be able to be exposed to being an actress as a mm -hmm. young child. Because mm -hmm. it gave me the experience of like, oh, yeah, it's just an emotion. Yeah. And like, you know, and as it, and, and when I started to get more into the acting, it was like, I actually wanted to be able to really dive deeper into whatever that emotional energy was. Then I, you know, it was like, you got rewarded in that space. And I also got to experience the, um, there's a, you know, there's definitely a, an aliveness that one experiences also when you're going through any kind of an emotional process. Mm -hmm. And I think that when you know when we're when we're taught to 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 keep the emotions kind of in the back you know backstage, um, we don't get to experience always that that aliveness and that uh, that kind of budding open that wants to happen. Yeah. Um, did did you when you were were you able to use acting as a way to facilitate a an emotion that needed to come out almost like in a therapeutic sense oh yeah i mean i can tell you one experience i was in seventh grade and there were so many but one i was in a um we were doing a children's theater project and it was it was actually for this like competition and the theme of the children's theater that we were doing was actually child abuse. Mm. And I like volunteered myself to be the one that was sexually abused. Whoa. Whoa. Holy shit. Yeah. So I got to play out this part and be seen by everyone. And that was like my little secret. Nobody knew that what I was saying was actually true. Oh my gosh. And then I remembered you know, I used that energy. I remember we were in final round and I remember this, just this finality of a final round. And I remember feeling like this is my chance. This yeah. is my opportunity to turn on this aliveness, to see I am a human being. Huh. This is my experience. And I, you know, I cried 
in this final round in the seventh grade and you know we got first place yeah, got wow. to Paramount yeah. Studios you know it was like this incredible so I like I was very lucky because I had somehow you know enough expressive ability to to kind of be in that domain and mm -hmm. and also then of course got rewarded you know to be in that space of expression and to being witnessed and I remember also feeling whenever I was able to reach those states I always could feel in the energy of the room when that 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 bit of composure was sort of melted away we could feel in the room people's energy just sort of something open mm -hmm. you know in the humanity where we were all connected mm -hmm. and i remember feeling that's what i wanted to feel the most you know mm -hmm. like when you have those kind of traumas you feel so separate mm -hmm. you feel somehow like you're not normal right. and so it was this really interesting way i was able to like kind of be a uh, an advocate on some level you know, mm -hmm. for other people that have, you know, gone through my experience. But but ultimately, I think inside of that realm of acting, it was like just wanting to reach that level of humanity. I wanted to feel like, you know, as much as we try to keep it together, everybody in the audience can relate yeah. to that sorrow, can relate to that pain. And that's what makes us human. That's the beauty, you know, of being human and alive and like, wouldn't it be great if we were able to um, be more fluid with those states mm. and, you know, how much more quickly would we actually get to know each other yeah. and to get to experience, mm. anyway, truth, I think. Yeah, ultimately. yeah, yeah. I, that I, I believe that you, you're like the conduit for the facilitation of the release of those emotions for the group of people that are in the audience that don't have the ability to do it themselves or like you're facilitating that right. release of that emotion. Uh, uh, do you know Bo Eason? Bo Eason, he, uh, former NFL football player, safety for the Houston Oilers. And he's done a, he's done a Broadway play. He wrote a wow. Broadway play based on experiences he had in football. Wow. Played on Broadway. I mean, performed it, I guess, 1,400, 1,500 times, and it was on Broadway. So he's, like, really done his, his thing. And, he, and it was um, – I did some training with him, and he was talking about how your job on stage is to um, connect with the audience – and see what the audience needs so you facilitate that and there was one of the speeches that I had worked on with him was my experience of throwing the ball to first base when my knee popped the last time and that experience of me laying on the ground you know sweat dripping down my face sand in my mouth clutching my left knee towards my chest and in hearing hearing like screaming Wow. two or three times and then realizing like everything came together and realizing that that voice was coming out of me. But conveying that on stage in a way where the, the, the people felt that, yeah. that experience of their entire world just changed because their physical body wasn't working like they thought it was. Mm. And um, I remember the feeling of walking off stage and just like losing my shit <laughs> of just like crying because there was so much emotion swirling around that I didn't have like this. Um, it wasn't reined in anymore. It was just, it was just coming out. Yeah. And, wow. and when that happens, it's like, that's part of my own process. That's also part of, the people that were in the audience, their process and having people come up and share that experience that like, wow, I really know yeah. what you're talking about. Yes. And I think like we were talking about this last night at our gathering about the mirror neurons in the brain mm. and how a lot of 
well, basically that, and I'm not going to be able to just to explain this as, as well as someone that's a little bit more experienced in this, but from what I understand, essentially the idea is that we have these neurons that fire in our brain that kind of synchronize with other people um, that are observers. So it can be doing a simple action, um, but it has to be a, a, a goal oriented. The action itself has to have some kind of goal. Um, in mind, but that there's this kind of learning that can happen, mm -hmm. that we can synchronize each other with each other's brains. And it's almost as though, let's say I'm, you know, reaching for that carton of milk, that actually my being feels like I just reached for that carton of milk, you know, pulled it down. But in relationship to the acting world, that's totally how I felt it. It was like, I need to move towards the direction of this, whatever this emotional state is, mm -hmm. to experience it. And then I could feel that that the audience syncing up with that experience yeah. as well. And um, I think that, that we're all going through such complex experiences that there's, um, I think we're sort of meant to go have those kind of process, you know, happening, yeah. whether we're going to see something on the stage or you know, listen to a piece of music. But when you do do it in a community, and you're actually in the same room, there's something very potent about that kind of learning. And I do feel that that is a part of, you know, we talk about this like evolution in consciousness. Mm. I think where we will really see the most evolution in consciousness is where people are gathering. Mm -hmm. And there's some type of that, uh, transmission, learning transmission taking place, um, whether it's conscious or not conscious, where people are able to synchronize um, with, you know, on the level of the brain and the emotional level and, you know, this sort of psychological, spiritual level. Mm -hmm. And something very magical begins to happen. Yeah. So I like that. I like it so much because I feel like when we come together as a community, without putting out a lot of effort, I always feel extremely transformed. And I mm. think there's something just so interesting about that, you know, yeah. that the old paradigm of learning is like, I mean, you have to go to school, you've got to educate, you've got to read this many books, you've got to, you know, regurgitate all these facts. But I think there's something new starting to emerge now where we're learning that learning is actually much more than just taking in data and learning facts. It's actually an integration. Yeah of experience. So how can we create more context for that type of integration, that kind of relating so that we can speed right through, you know, and get glean these new insights in a more quick fashion. I mean, if I can watch one have it happen and learn it. Yeah. That's great. Well, I know, I know that was for me studying martial <laughs> arts. If I was able to watch somebody do it or watch a video of someone do it, yeah. then I could get my brain around it and I could start teaching my body how to move that way. Right. Uh, but if I if I was just trying to like have someone describe it or something like that, like it, it took forever. And as we're talking about this, I'm one of the things that's kind of been in the forefront the past twenty four hours ish has been um, spending like a ridiculous amount of time on Facebook and the social media feeds yeah. and stuff like I that. Know. And all this shit that's out there. And, I, and I'm believing that there's like this uh, evolution of consciousness taking place, awareness that's taking place, facilitation of emotional states, uh, mental paradigms and, and trauma that is being facilitated by these social media feeds and it it's like one of these things that we will buy into the story until we choose until we're done <laughs> essentially until we're done and i've kind of gotten to that place where it's like i'll watch and i'll watch it i'll, I'll watch certain trends you know that's yeah. what google and Facebook, they're all looking at trends. And if you look at those things long enough, and, and a lot of people get spun out about that until you can make like a conscious choice of going, oh, wow, I don't 
I can create my own reality. I could just step away from that and focus on something completely different. And then we get into like what we talked about on the in the first the first uh, episode of like the hundredth monkey wasn't the hundredth monkey eventually uh, did we talk about the hundredth monkey in the list I remember that maybe we talked about that but I know we, maybe yeah. not <laughs> maybe <laughs> not you know maybe it was it I, it happened I think that idea though is so true I think, honestly a lot of these things are like instinctual. I think that's why I'm sort of curious about this whole mirror neuron thing because I think it's tied to social media. Mm -hmm. It's like there's a part of us that knows that we can learn in this different type of fashion. Mm -hmm. And we're drawn to this space because we're wanting to get that sort of social transmission. Mm -hmm. You know, there's this kind of, there's something that wants to be learned on a, um, on a cultural level, but it's not really curated right now so much inside of that face feed it's very random and you know and that's one of the things that that i started to experiment with inside of facebook and creating you know group like creating uh, your own group and it was so interesting how a whole different ethos emerged once it was more curated and um and that a lot of learning really did take place mm -hmm. through the internet space and huge shifts actually happening inside of that space it was not I know that it sounds bizarre maybe to people out there but I have friends that I've met through the internet that I've made art with over the years that have become like extremely dear friends mm -hmm. and some of them I still haven't met even in the physical uh -huh. like we've had extremely deep connections but it was through creating this kind of space mm -hmm. that, that did happen. Um, I think this is a good conversation to have, though, because we are all on some level sort of magnetically drawn to these, you know, to this kind of social media space. But this is all new. This is all just like new technology. This is new stuff. And we're trying to learn how is it how is it integrating with the software of our brain and how that's wired, mm -hmm. you know, and if we start to learn and understand a little bit more about how that's wired, yeah. then we can't curate this space. We can't use these tools in ways that are actually more, more helpful, you know, more helpful at evolving us into being, um, you know, more empathetic mm -hmm. more compassionate. Um, and you know, and not just consumers, because that's the culture that we we're coming out of. We were, this is very consumptive kind of society. Mm -hmm. I think the internet itself is actually much more a tool for harnessing empathy than actually anything else. Hmm. Um, but we've still been using it. It's like having, getting a hammer and using it like screw, you know, you have to understand what is the tool, the tool, it's a connective tool actually. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, but we're still working through the kinks of our own ability to connect and relate. You know, just getting on a video conversation like this can be very intimidating. I mean, I've done it enough now where it doesn't feel as scary anymore. It feels, you know, like kind of normal now. Yeah. But I know I have clients that can't get on it, just even when it's just them and me. Mm -hmm. So I do know that there's that deep level of like, you know, not programming being, and not being seen um, but it's still just a tool like just like when we got the telephone people were like i don't want to be able to have people be able to call me you know that these things are anyway so if we i think if we can look at you know what are we naturally drawn to to creating to help unify and create this harmony within our beings Mm -hmm. I think, you know, the main thing is community and, mm -hmm. and it ha an authentic community. Mm -hmm. So uh, how can we use these tools that we have been given? Like we're, we're doing, you know, mm, right. You know, that's exactly why we created this. We're like, well, we like having these conversations. We're learning from it and we can share mm -hmm. and, you know, let's see where that takes us. Right. Uh, one thing in, in I, I'd invite you to help me remember this because I didn't remember today. We're, we're to invite those that are watching this to ask questions. Nice. These will be yes. in uh, social media feeds you know, on my YouTube channel, the Knee Pain Guru YouTube channel. 
So if you enter questions below, wherever this you might find this video, uh, those questions will eventually make their way to us and we can answer those questions. So if there's something that we're talking about that intrigues you, that sparks an idea or a question or a comment in some way, um, please ask the question and we will cover it on one of our subsequent calls. And once we, once Megwin and I get the technology together about the live streaming, you'll be able to ask those questions in time. Live, live and in person. All right. It, it, live, live from New York. It's Megwin. No, I'm in Asheville. Oh well, that's right. It, I, it's the perfect balance. You're like the, you know, you're the beautiful city girl, eloquently speaking, um, theater body worker, and I'm like you know, the guy living in the mountains in Western North Carolina. Yeah, uh, grounding it out. That's right. In that primal root energy. Yeah, fire going in the background, keeping the house warm. Like that's my only way of heating this house. Wow. If if I don't have a fire, it doesn't get heated. Well, then you just you really have to have some cuddle parties or something. Yes, yeah, something like that. Yeah, they. Uh, yeah, I'd be down. I'd be down for that. I'm going to see who shows up for the cuddle party. I think you stumbled me there just for a second. Well, Okay, now what do we talk about? We are at 56, 57 minutes in, uh, in chatting. How's your throat feeling? How's that? It's feeling, actually, it is feeling a little better. Clear? Yeah. It is feeling a little clearer. I think this has been helping. The lemon, the lemon is. Well, I didn't have lemon, but. Well, yeah, that that helps clear phlegm, and yeah. uh, uh, what was the other thing? A vitamin C is a really good one. That'll help. I feel like the oregano oil. That's kind of maybe a little intense. Maybe you don't have to do that too Candy. much, but it does. Yeah, clear yeah. Pretty well. Yeah, that and uh, neti pot is really good. I did that today. Actually. Nice. That's cool. That that's really helped me a lot. Um, I would love to just also throw out there. Yes. Sort of our our theme in a way today feels like it did have. I mean, this was, I, I definitely sort of drove this a little bit because I, you know, art projects. Yeah. Um, but this idea, this theme of creating communities that synergize together to also form new paradigms of healing. I'm just curious if people have these kind of communities um, and how they work, how they meet, like how, oh, yeah. you know, if That'd anybody be... wants to share yeah. anything like that, I think we can all learn. Um, because your community doesn't even have to be physical community. Like I had mentioned earlier that I also had an art community where a lot of it was just meeting digitally. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of new communities forming that are, you know, on that digital level and, and, you know, how can we merge that into having also these live experiences where people are coming together yeah. and, and connecting in a, in a real physical way. Um, Seth Godin talks a lot about this. Uh, he's, he's an, an awesome yeah. thought leader and he talks a lot about tribes and how we're really living in the age of the tribe mm -hmm. and, you know, how there's a lot of potential right now to organize and to facilitate all of these little mini tribes, mm -hmm. you know, all around different types of um, activities, interests, and, and actually how important these tribes are to the direction that we take our lives and the decisions that we make and how we feel about ourselves and how we're showing up in the world. Mm. Yeah, that'd be great. Leave it in the questions or comments section wherever you see this. Uh, we'll post this video on Megwin's feed as well as my feed and social media and Facebook. Hey. Okay. <laughs> and I, I think I'm going to make more of a habit of posting stuff and then um, and getting offline. <laughs> yes. 
I know, and those like having those strategies is really. I look, now I do this kind of ritual thing where like I used to like just leave the computer you know off and and have it be open, but now I'm I'm like I am now creating a boundary. No yeah. more computer energy, and I have to close the computer. Yeah. You know, like even just having that little ritual of closing it up. And now I'm like, okay, now I'm in my own world. Yeah. Like just having it open sometimes is like so tempting. It is. It, and it's addictive. I could feel it. I could it feel that like some things I get addicted to. Yeah. And usually I do something drastic to kind of shake that up. Whatever yeah. that, I, I don't think it ever gets quite to an addiction with me, but I recognize it as a pattern and then try to set up the conditions that change things up. So it isn't. It isn't absorbing all of my time or I don't let it stay in addiction. It'll be short addiction. Sure. Um, oh, one of the things that I posted on my Facebook thing, I think I think it was this morning. Um, it was kind of like the 100th monkey. Maybe I talked about it last time or I don't know. It happened sometime. Um, but doing starting January 1st, doing a... 30 day sleep challenge. Everyone wants to do like these exercise challenges after the first of the year. What if you got like really good sleep for 30 days? So what would that look like? Cause... Well, um, I was thinking it would be setting parameters because not everyone can do the same type. I already of... like it already. Well, like there's something that's so sexy about Setting parameters and yeah, you know, well, kind of. I'm thinking discipline around the sleep. Yeah, like there, there's things you can do from um, setting up your room in a way where yeah. um, uh, you can shut off the Wi-Fi in your house. You can get every you know blackout curtains and stuff like that, where you have this really sacred space to sleep, and then you're going to bed, be it. Eight, nine, ten o'clock at night. That's so hard. Though. I didn't fun. say it was going to be easy, but this is where everyone's individual thing will come into play. Ten o'clock may be the ten o'clock may be the time for you. That might be hard. Maybe Eleven hard. o'clock may be. But that's what I'm saying. Different people yes. in different parts of the country. By the time um, five thirty, it's dark here in the mountains. Like it's dark. Well, it is so different in another in other spaces, but I'm and, up for the challenge. And that's what I'm saying. You create like um create like a context around it. Like okay, Meg, when your accountability is, I'm going to be in bed by eleven o'clock every night. And if you get up at seven, that's eight hours of sleep. Now, if we work on making sure your diet is dialed in, the supplementation is dialed in, your the context of where you're sleeping is dialed in make those tweaks and adjustments and now you get a solid eight hours of sleep every night it's built into your routine how is your how are you going to think how are your emotions how is your body going to feel in 30 days doing that consistently Love that. so instead of it being like this oh I'm gonna lose 20 pounds or I'm gonna lift more weight or something like that what about like self-care that's real like solid and going to leave you in this really awesome place to think clearly and choose like some really awesome things starting January 1st of 2017. Well, there's some really fun rituals I love to do too, right before I go to sleep that I started getting into like this past year mm -hmm. that I love to do, which is, you know, that, 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 that uh, space right before you're falling asleep. Yes. Right, you're just kind of lying there, and maybe things are kind of going through your brain, reviewing what happened through the day, mm -hmm. reflecting and thoughts. Um, so I have this new ritual which I have done very consistently for the last like nine months, and I really love it. It's just basically been like one hand on my heart, one hand like down in my belly, and I just lie there, and I just sort of basically just send loving thoughts. Um, affirming thoughts, affirming love, you know, into my being mm -hmm. right before I go to bed, right, right before I'm falling asleep. Just, I love you. I love you. I love you. And whatever the emotions are, mm -hmm. just, just affirming that as, you know, I love you. 
And I could really feel that that started to build up a very strong energy over, you know, a couple of months of doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's fun to think about little rituals that you can tie into, you know, the sleep as well. Mm-hmm. I like and, the idea. Yeah, okay. so I was I was thinking about that doing that January first. Maybe we'll we'll put something together. We'll facilitate that. Do something, something. I don't know. Maybe create our own little tribe, our sleep tribe. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. So we're gonna call it a wrap for today. I think so. Okay. So if someone wanted to get in touch with Megwin, how would they go about yes. doing that? They can go to my website, which is embodyvoice, E-M-B-O-D-Y, voice.com. <laughs> which is even more funny today. Right. But we'll spell it out in the, right. in the description. And uh, then, yeah, anything else? Yes. Uh, or they can email me at, at megwinwhite at gmail.com as well. Great. And for um, those who want to get in touch with me, you can go to the kneepainguru.com or you can send an email to customer service at the kneepainguru.com. You can reach reach me there as well. You can also be found on Facebook, Twitter. Yes. What else are you on? You're on Instagram. You're on Pinterest. Are you on Pinterest? I am on Pinterest. Yeah, there you go. They can I, find you anywhere. You can't hide. No, I, I you can't hide. Just, um, no. Not with that hair. You're not hiding anywhere. <laughs> and not with that voice. <laughs> uh, It'll be back hopefully to... Hopefully in our next episode, my voice will have had a nice, beautiful transformation. Yes. I'll sing a little opera for you. Oh, cool. That would be a good way to start next one. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, really We're going to... myself into shape. Okay, we're going to wrap it up for today. We'll see everybody next week. Thank you so much for listening. And until next time, bye.